SEP Fanfic Readings Presents A Thousand Words by Olive Juice 28 Chapter 57 Putting It to the Test The week of exams was finally upon them, and none of the seventh or eighth years were quite sure if they were more relieved to have their months of study sessions and late-night reviews over with, or terrified to actually begin the process of recalling all the information they'd hopefully stored in their overworked brains. More than a few doses of calming draft and dreamless sleep had been procured from Madame Pomfrey in recent days, and the younger students had noticed their mentors and older housemates walking around with slightly dazed expressions on their faces, that they were more jittery and prone to being easily startled when approached. For instance, Darla happened upon Hermione in the library one evening, and didn't think anything of striking up a conversation with the curly-haired witch, as she had done countless times before. She walked towards her friend, who was standing between two rows of shelves, making no attempt to quiet her steps, but Hermione was still so absorbed with the book in her hands that she didn't hear the young Ravenclaw. When Darla greeted her in the library-approved whisper, the older girl jumped and shrieked as if she'd been fired at by a blast into scrute, and the book she'd been reading went flying into the air. Her reaction caused Darla to squeal and immediately crouch down with her hands over her head in case the book would land on her. Thankfully, Neville happened to be across the aisle and cast a floating charm on the book, avoiding any damage to both people and property. The girls dissolved into giggles once they caught their breath, and Madame Pince, who had come bustling over to see what all the unruly commotion was about, abandoned her usual lecture in favor of simply reminding everyone to be more careful before emitting a long-suffering sigh and walking away. She knew this was a stressful time for the older students, and was not about to make things worse by admonishing one of the library's most regular and most respectful visitors. In fact, if anyone had been paying attention— they would have thought the keeper of Hogwarts tomes was rather losing her edge these days. Just three days earlier, she'd come across Ginny Weasley and two of her housemates all fast asleep at a table covered with books and scrolls they'd been studying in preparation for their defense exam. Instead of waking them up with harsh words or a clap of the hands, she'd simply closed the covers and rolled up the parchments and cast a warming charm over them, since the castle still got a little drafty at night, even in June. Last Sunday, she had noticed Anthony Goldstein had taken his traditional seat at the table closest to the ancient runes text shortly after breakfast, and was still there when she'd returned from lunch in the afternoon. He had clearly been in the middle of writing down something important, and not wishing to break his concentration. She had conjured a small plate of sandwiches and a bottle of pumpkin juice. She placed them on the chair next to him, since putting them on the table where they could come in direct contact with the books he was using would be utter madness— and gave one brisk nod when he goggled at her with wide, disbelieving eyes. The way NEWTs were set up, two or three exams were scheduled each day, and students would take whichever ones they had been enrolled in classes for that year. Everyone in both of the top years would be taking the standard exams, such as History of Magic and Defense Against the Dark Arts, but beyond that, it was based on what each student had decided to pursue after OWLs. For example, Padma would be taking charms, divination, transfiguration, and arithmancy. Dean would sit for care of magical creatures, potions, and muggle studies. Hermione, to no one's surprise, had taken the most subjects out of all of them that year, and as a result, would be sitting for charms, transfiguration, potions, arithmancy, ancient runes, and herbology. Draco's schedule was similar, although he had decided to pursue alchemy instead of charms. Each morning, the inhabitants of the room met for breakfast, and several fortifying cups of coffee or very strong tea. General well-wishes and sentiments of good luck were uttered as they made their way towards the great hall, where all the written exams would take place. After lunch, practical exams were proctored in whatever space necessary, the potions classroom, the greenhouse, or the paddock outside Hagrid's hut among them. By the time dinner rolled around, the eighth years would reconvene around the table and share their experiences with far less enthusiasm than typically infused into their conversations. Earlier than normal, they would trudge off to their respective beds where they would succumb to the exhaustion wrought upon them by all the stress and studying, only to get up the next morning and repeat the cycle again. Friday afternoon, once the final exam had been taken, the housemates had dragged themselves back to the room and unanimously agreed that a nap was in order. Everyone disappeared into their own chambers, and a peaceful silence settled over the normally active and noisy space. It was into this quiet and seemingly empty dormitory Bill entered a few hours later. He was more than a little surprised to find the common area completely empty, and wondered where they all could have gone off to, but his musings were cut short when Dean emerged from his room, yawning and stretching. "'Feeling a little worn,' Bill joked. "'Ugh, yes!' Dean ran a hand down his still sleepy face, 
So glad that's over. Everyone else having a kip then? Yeah, but they should be getting up soon for dinner. That's actually why I'm here, Bill explained. Fleur and I wanted to have you lot around to ours for a pizza party. Bit of a celebration for the end of exams, yeah? Pizza, Dean grinned with disbelief. Where'd you get pizza? The older wizard shrugged and looked rather pleased with himself. Pulled a few strings at the ministry and had it delivered from a shop in London. He snickered at the look of wonder currently taking over Dean's face. That's brilliant, the former Gryffindor replied. Well, it helps when your entire family is close with Harry Potter. Not much they'll refuse him, so why not enjoy the benefits? Bill winked conspiratorially, and Dean just snorted and nodded in agreement. If you could round everyone up and bring them over as soon as they're ready, that'd be great. Will do, Dean agreed enthusiastically, and headed off to begin corralling his friends as Bill left to make sure everything was in order. Less than an hour later, all ten of the eighth years were happily ensconced in Professor Weasley's private quarters. The small sitting area contained a sofa and two armchairs, and the kitchenette boasted its small table with four chairs, all of which had been dragged over for the extra seating. Several students sat on the floor, and everyone was raving about the pizza, trying all the different toppings, and generally stuffing themselves until they couldn't move. "'I think that last piece is lodged in the middle of my rib cage. Theo groaned from the floor, where he'd sprawled out in front of the fireplace, after scarfing down at least six large slices. "'Well, that tends to happen when you eat enough for two people.' Daphne teased after daintily taking another bite of her spinach and feta piece. "'But it's so good,' whinged the lanky brunette. "'I couldn't stop myself. "'Lack of self-control isn't typically a Slytherin trait, you know,' Draco drawled lazily from his seat on the sofa. He'd actually had pizza once before. Harry had brought one to the manor towards the end of the summer, and both he and his mother had been absolutely enthralled by the muggle dish." He'd still eaten four and a half slices, which left him feeling full and sleepy, but perfectly content. Hermione was sitting on the floor, leaning against his legs and chatting with Hannah, while he repeatedly wound and unwound one of her glossy curls in his finger. "'It's amazing,' Neville announced with a great sigh, as he looked longingly at the multiple pieces still in the boxes. "'I'm afraid I'll blow up if I eat another one, though.' "'You know,' Dean sat up a little straighter in the chair he'd been slumped in. "'I've been thinking.' but several of the housemates cut him off. Oh, no. Not again. Dean's had a thought. Prepare yourselves. Shut it, you lot, he grumbled and waved them off, a grin tugging at his lips. What would you think about continuing our game nights after we're done here? He let the idea float out there, his gaze roaming across the group as they all considered it. Explain, Padma insisted. We wouldn't be able to do every week, I'm sure, but what about every month or so? We could pick a place to meet and coordinate snacks and games. He shrugged and looked a little more serious than was typical for the jovial wizard. I really enjoyed our weekly competitions, and I hate the thought of not seeing everyone so regularly. Aw, we'll miss your ugly mug too, Theo announced from the floor, and everyone chuckled. I think that's a great idea, Dean, Luna said supportively, and her comment was met with nods and noises of agreement. Wonder where we could meet, Anthony mused. Why not here? Hermione suggested, and eleven pairs of wide eyes turned in her direction as she hastened to explain. We could ask Professor McGonagall if we could still use the room, or even another space if that's otherwise occupied, and see if she'd be willing to let us use her flu. She trailed off as she surveyed her circle of friends, and was reminded again how terribly she would miss them, and how very much she hoped they could manage to make Dean's idea work. That's definitely a possibility, said Bill thoughtfully. "'especially if you promise to also connect with your first years, "'who will, of course, be second years by that point.' "'Oh, that would be lovely!' Hannah exclaimed, and everyone else nodded. "'I was just talking to Andrew about that the other day,' Neville added. "'This would be a great way to do that.' "'Plus,' Bill added, "'I know McGonagall has every intention of pairing the new seventh years with incoming firsts, "'so they might appreciate that opportunity to bounce ideas off you all, "'or ask questions about what worked and what didn't.' "'Again, murmurs of understanding rumbled through the room.' I don't know, interjected Draco. I mean, that's going to be a really long commute for me. Not sure I'd be able to make it every month. Before he could even finish his sentence, a small pillow came soaring through the air, courtesy of Padma, grazing the top of his head before landing on the floor behind the couch. Everyone laughed, knowing he'd be living in the castle. Right then, Dean clapped his hands together, a wide grin on his friendly face. Hermione, would you be willing to speak to the headmistress with me in the next week, since you're my game night partner and all? He wiggled his eyebrows at her, and she knew that although he hid it well, he still found their former transfiguration professor to be rather intimidating. Of course, she responded with a smile. 
"'Well, then I guess the problems of the world have been solved,' chuckled Bill. The students took this as a sign that it was time to head back to the room, and began cleaning up the remaining boxes, and putting the Weasley's sitting room back to rights. "'Daphne, could you stay for just a moment?' Fleur asked the pretty witch, who looked surprised but was happy to comply. Everyone else filed out of the door after repeated thanks to their host, Theo insisting that they were going to have to roll him to his bed, as he was still so stuffed. The walk back to the dormitory was filled with excited chatter about the possibility of continuing their game nights. Dean and Anthony were in animated discussion about all the muggle games they'd yet to try, while Neville was wondering aloud about what McGonagall might decide to use the room for after they had all moved out. "'What are you looking so smug about?' Hermione poked Draco in the side as they walked together down the corridor. She had noticed the all-too-familiar smirk on his face as they'd helped clean up from dinner, and it hadn't left his handsome features since. "'Well, if McGonagall gives us permission to meet every month, that means I'll get to see you at least once every four weeks.' He wrapped his arms around her shoulders and pulled her closer. "'I've been trying not to obsess over it, but the thought of not seeing you regularly is sending me spare, and this gives me at least a little bit of a guarantee that I'll get to spend some time with you every few weeks.' He glanced down at her and noticed she was frowning slightly, and her eyes rather glassy. "'Hey,' he stopped and turned to face her fully. "'What's wrong?' She huffed a small breath and gave a wobbly smile as a single tear slid down her cheek. "'I hate the thought of leaving you here, of leaving you.' He cupped her face in his hands and bent down slightly so that he could look directly into her whiskey-colored eyes. "'It's going to be fine. We are going to be fine. It will be an adjustment, certainly, but we'll make it work.' Yeah? He used his thumb to wipe the lone tear and leaned in to press a soft, sweet kiss to her lips. When they pulled apart, he wrapped her in a tight embrace, knowing there was nothing more he could do. He knew that as much as he was struggling with the year coming to an end, his sweet witch was dealing with the much heavier load. Most of her future was very undecided, as of yet, while she tried to cope with the continued absence of her parents, the fact that she didn't have a job or career path lined up, or even where she was going to live. While Harry had told her she could stay with him as long as she wanted, Draco knew she'd really only planned to be at Grimmauld Place for the school year. Hopefully, he reminded himself as he continued to hold her in the now empty hallway, by the time she actually moved out of the castle, things with her parents would be back to normal, and perhaps that would alleviate some of her other worries. It made him nauseatingly anxious every time he thought about how close they were to the commencement exercises McGonagall had planned, and that even before then, he was supposed to go with Harry to meet the Grangers. If all went according to Alcott's predictions, in eight days, Hermione's parents would be watching her graduate from Hogwarts. Needing to hop off this train of thought before he blurted out something he wasn't supposed to, he rubbed her back and pressed a kiss to the top of her curls. "'You all right?' he asked quietly. She nodded, her cheeks still pressed against his jumper-clad chest, sniffed twice and stepped back to meet his concerned gaze. "'Thanks. It just sort of hit me.' She gave a small chuckle and shook her head. No need to thank me. I completely understand. We should get back to the room, I suppose. She held out her hand, and he happily took it, his fingers interlacing with hers automatically. They had only taken a few steps when they heard someone approaching from behind, and turned to see Daphne making her way down the hall. Hey, Daph, Hermione greeted. Everything all right? Oh, yes! Daphne was positively beaming as she caught up with them. Fleur was talking to me about a job. The usually calm and poised witch was practically bouncing as she shared her news. She's been working at Gladrags this year, right? Draco and Hermione both nodded in understanding. Well, I've talked to her a few times about my interest in fashion and designing, and she apparently spoke to the shop owner, Mrs. Beecham, about having me come on as an apprentice this summer. Daphne squealed and clapped her hands together delightedly as both of her friends exclaimed with joyful congratulations and pulled her in for an exuberant hug. "'That's wonderful!' Hermione grinned. "'You won't have any trouble getting up here for monthly game nights then.' "'Nope!' the blonde witch laughed. "'And according to Fleur, there's a tiny flat above the shop that Mrs. Beecham sometimes lets, but it's empty right now, and she said I could stay there.' "'Brilliant!' cheered Draco, truly happy for his housemate until a daunting thought crossed his mind, and he chose his words carefully so as not to completely ruin her mood. "'You'll get to see Astoria more often, too, since she's got one more year here.' Daphne correctly interpreted his statement as a query about her parents, too, and her brow furrowed slightly. Astoria will be thrilled. My parents, less so. I tried talking to them over the Easter halls again about a career in design, but they seem to think it's just a passing phase. 
My mother said she'd take me shopping and would even hire a seamstress to come to the house to make a custom set of robes for me, like that would take care of my little fascination with clothes. She snorted delicately and continued. My father likes to pretend I haven't said anything about it at all. I honestly think he believes if he ignores it, I'll change my mind or forget about it. But this truly is what I want to do. I know I should be a good little pure-blood witch and return home from school to attend socials and plan parties and basically pass the time with social nonsense until my parents find a suitable match for me. But the thought of that makes me want to scream. She rolled her eyes and huffed in frustration. Hermione looped her arm through Daphne's as they started walking in the direction of the room, Draco flanking her other side. "'Will you go home after the commencement?' Hermione asked. "'I'll have to, won't I?' Daphne sighed. "'I'll need to pack more than what I've brought to school this term if I'm moving into the flat.' She paused, and a look of determination crossed her pretty features. "'I'm going to visit Mrs. Beecham before I go home, and get some sort of contract. Something in writing that outlines the arrangements. Something binding that they can't argue with, even though I'm sure they'll try.' "'I think that's a smart move,' Draco stated. "'They'll probably be angry for a bit, disappointed even, "'since they'll view what I'm doing as beneath my station. "'But who even cares about any of that any more? "'I certainly don't, and I'm not going to live as if I do.' "'Daphne nodded firmly, almost more to herself than anyone else, "'and seemed to have resolved this course of action to the best. "'Well, I admire you for stepping out and doing what you're passionate about, "'even if it might cause a little trouble,' Hermione said sincerely. "'Thank you,' Daphne smiled at the curly-haired witch. By this point they had reached the dormitory and entered to find the common room area empty, except for Dean, who seemed to be waiting for them. "'Hermione,' he beckoned from the, in front of the fire, "'we never finished talking about tomorrow's game night.' "'Oh, you're right!' she squeaked. She gave Draco a quick kiss on the cheek, then hurried over to her co-planner, leaving him standing by the door and chuckling to himself at the enthusiastic hand motions his girlfriend was already employing as she shared her ideas with her fellow former Gryffindor.'